one year ago. One year ago, I started making YouTube videos. Well, there's top five milks, but we don't talk about that video here. But it's crazy to think that one whole year has gone by and that it all started with this video. An hour and a half long ranking video of all the Goosebumps episodes. Why I start off with such a challenging video to make? I didn't even dip my toes and just cannonballed into the deep end. But I'm glad I did it. Not because of the quality of the actual video. That video sucks. There's too many clips and I'm quiet and mumble through the whole damn thing. And the editing is just bad. But I'm glad I made it because it proved that I could do this. I can make videos. A lot of growing pains and lots of areas I need improving, but it's where I started. And starting's the hardest part. Plus, it's probably where a majority of you first found my channel. But enough of that. I know you didn't click on this video to watch some nobody self-reflect. You came here to watch every Are You Afraid of the Dark episode ranked from worst to best. Or you just need some background noise while you write your essay. I mean, either way, you're here now. But before I jump into the ranking, let me just address some things real quick. I grew up watching Goosebumps. I saw almost all of them as a kid. And when I made that video last year, I kind of already knew the rough placements of a majority of the episodes. I was also just familiar with the Goosebumps story structure and accustomed to its hearty dose of cheese. Are you afraid of the dark on the other hand? I never grew up with it. I saw like two or three episodes as a teenager and that was it. So my ranking in this video is primarily based on a one and done watch of every episode. I point this out because I recognize that some episodes may be better on a second watch, but I just don't have time to rewatch any of these episodes. Which leads me to my next point. How many episodes exactly are included in every? Well, this is where it gets a little messy. There is exactly 100 episodes of Are You Afraid of the Dark? But nine of those come from the 2019 reboot, so those don't count. And then 26 of those are from the 1999 revival. You see, the original series ran from 1991 to 1996, and then was revived for two seasons that ran from 1999 to 2000. Now, I had to make a hard call here. Because on one hand, the revival seasons aren't part of the original run. But on the other hand, they're still given the season 6 and season 7 monikers, as if it's a continuation of sorts. Tough call, but I'll only be ranking the original series run. You can disagree all you want, you can say that this video is a lie and that every means every, but if the Wikipedia page makes it a point to separate the two, then I'm gonna keep them separate. Plus, that means I only have to watch 65 episodes as opposed to 91. But this intro has gone on long enough. I can sense that even the person watching this is background noise is ready to click off. And if you want to know how I'll be judging these episodes, just watch the first two minutes of my Goosebumps video. I'm using the same grading criteria here. Without further ado, let's just jump into it. Submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society, this is every Are You Afraid of the Dark episode, ranked from worst to best. Tale of the Long Ago Locket. This one's the most perplexing one to me, because clearly it's a bad episode, it's literally at the bottom of the list. But even when it comes to bad episodes, at least you can see an attempt being made to be scary, you know? They're still within the realms of horror, whether that's more existential or big scary monster focused. You can at least understand what they were trying to go for. But I mean, Long Ago Locket? Are you scared of British people? Because those are the monsters in this story. And I doubt that any kid after watching this episode is gonna check beneath their bed for red coats. But the story is this. Josh likes April, but doesn't have the guts to tell her. He stumbles into the woods where he meets Lieutenant Williams, who's an American spy amongst the Redcoats, whose cover was blown and is now on the run from the British. Lieutenant Williams' story parallels Josh's predicament, as the lieutenant wants to escape from the force and confess his love for his girl back home. Except that doesn't happen, because in a history textbook, it is said that he is hung from a tree for being a spy. So now it's up to Josh to alter history, which... Okay, I know Josh is this stand-up guy and part of the reason why he wants to help Williams out in the first place is that he himself is in a similar situation. However, he could just not, <laughs> you know? He could just not go into the woods. And that's the problem. The scary situation is optional for the main character. Usually, these predicaments are thrust onto the protagonist. Overall, it's a fine story, it just doesn't work for a show that's supposed to be scary. Like, you could at least make these scenes play out at night instead of broad daylight. The Tale of the Carved Stone 
I don't know what it is, but we got another time travel related story on our hands here. However, with it being his first appearance on the ranking, I get to talk about Mr. Sardo, or rather Sardo. No Mr. Emphasis on the Do. Cause yeah, Are You Afraid of the Dark has two reoccurring characters, and Sardo is one of them. He's basically a sleazeball cop man who runs an occult magic shop. He's always trying to get people to check out his fake vomit and sells items at a discounted price in which he insists that he's losing on the deal. The man himself doesn't really believe in magic, yet he always ends up selling kids magical or cursed items. Now my first time seeing this character come back I was confused because, well, in his first episode he kind of gets trapped in a crystal ball. But then I remembered that these episodes are just kids telling stories around a campfire. So while the show is episodic, a reoccurring character would make sense given the framing device. Anyways, back to the episode. Allison gets a stone that opens up a time portal from a mirror to 1892, where she meets a kid named Tom. Now, yeah, there's some banter and whatnot, Allison talking about the future and Tom having absolutely no frame of reference. It's cute. But then Tom and Allison go to 1992 together, and we don't really see Tom's reaction to the future. Like, at all. That's a 100 year difference, for Christ's sake, show him a toaster and his mind will be blown. But no, we don't get to see any of that because they're too busy focusing on the big bad of the episode. This bloodborne cosplayer named Septimus, whose only scary quality is having one really long fingernail. It's not scary and it doesn't take advantage of its one central concept. The Tale of the Sorcerer's Apprentice Basic plot of this one is that some nerdy kid named Dean gets brainwashed by an ancient artifact to bring back an evil sorcerer. Now, how do you bring an old ancient sorcerer back to life, you may ask? Well, by dumping a bunch of chemicals into your school's pool, of course. Now, I think the plot works better on paper because the execution is just misguided. You see, Brainwashed Dean becomes evil. You can clearly tell by the leather jacket here. But the majority of the episode focuses on Dean's evil persona, which, I don't know, edgy teenagers don't exactly scare me. I mean, I was raised on Newgrounds. I've seen more than enough in my time. It's not really until the last three minutes where shit really starts to go down. But even then, all it takes is some clothes chlorine to stop the summoning process. And all I'm saying is that if all it takes to stop you is some pool cleaner, then maybe you were never really a threat. The Tale of the Jagged Sign Okay, I need to get this out of the way. Are You Afraid of the Dark has a real ghost story problem. Like, I swear to God, there are so many ghost stories in this series, which would be fine if they all weren't so goddamn similar. And maybe this is unfairly ranked so low, but in my defense, this was a season five episode. I was in the final season and I was burnt out with these stories because the plot is simple. Basically, this ghost waited for his lover to meet him on this cliff, but she never came. Because unbeknownst to him, the girl's parents forbade her from going out that night. The dude falls off the cliff and dies, and now his ghost stays there on the cliff waiting. This old lady finds out the truth, kicks the bucket, and now the two can move on to the afterlife together. Is it sweet? Yes. Is it touching? Yes. But the show has done this so many times before in what I like to call emotional ghost stories. If this was a season 1 or season 2 episode, it probably would have ranked a tad bit higher. But 5 seasons in, been there, done that, give me something new. The Tale of the Frozen Ghost Hey hey hey! What did I just talk about? We got another emotional ghost story here. This time, our ghost of the week was a little kid who froze to death outside. Give him a jacket and bada bing bada boom, he moves on. Now, I'll give it credit here. The thought of a child freezing to death outside is disturbing. And with the ghost constantly saying, I'm cold, it does make it unnerving. But one weird thing I didn't notice about this episode is just how cheesy it is. It's got some over the top acting and some real 90s-esque camera movements. Which, all things considered, I would never describe Are You Afraid of the Dark as cheesy. It's actually a little bit more grounded than most. It often takes its time with its stories and naturally builds up to the spooky shit. So it's weird seeing this kid fall down into the mud with two different camera angles. Once again, it's not a bad episode, but the show does these exact same kinds of episodes way too much. The Tale of the Chameleons First off, that's not a chameleon, it's an iguana. Second off, you got Tia and Tamara from Sister Sister Fame starring in the episode, which is cool. I don't feel like you got big name child actors in these types of shows. And yes, Sister Sister was airing when this premiered. Now onto the episode itself, it's nothing special here. A <clears throat> 
chameleon, bites Janice twice and then turns into a copy of her, all while Janice turns into a chameleon when she's exposed to water. Janice bites the chameleon doppelganger her twice, turning herself back into a human. So you get this classic standoff at the end which is pretty tropic and played out for television. And that's kind of my problem with the episode. It's nothing I haven't seen before. And I'll give it credit, it does have the darkest ending in the show. The chameleon tricks Shannon into shooting Janice with water, thus turning her back into a chameleon. Then Sharon just throws that bitch into the well. Janice is stuck as a chameleon at the bottom of a well. There's no way of escaping and it's heavily implied that she'll die down there. And Are You For The Dark doesn't really do twist endings all that much. Occasionally they'll do an ambiguous ending, and they certainly don't do these kind of dark endings. Usually. Everything works out in the end, typically. So here's an episode that both has a twist ending and a dark ending, and I gotta give him props for that. If only I liked the rest of the episode. The Tale of Quicksilver. This episode is very forgettable for me. Like, honestly, I looked at my notes and I still couldn't remember the episode until I pulled it up on the wiki page. It's another ghost story, but this time around with all of its chips in the scary aspect. It's about a ghost who lives in the walls and that's it, really. I mean, of course there's more going on, but it's just standard story stuff that doesn't really hide in the story in any way. I don't know what else to say, really. The makeup on the ghost looks really good, especially with harsher shadows and, um, Hey, the person who plays Connie played Ashley Banks in Fresh Prince, so that's cool. The Tale of the Captured Souls Hey, you scared of mirrors? I mean, yeah, if you're ugly like me, you'll get a scare every morning when you wake up, but I'm just talking mirrors by themselves. Your answer is probably no, so my answer on whether or not you'll find this episode scary is going to be no, too. I'm just joking. The story behind this one is that this old guy named Pete runs a sort of Airbnb type thing, but the house is riddled with mirrors, and every mirror has a hidden camera behind them. The concept of constantly being spied on is already in its own right very creepy, but then Pete uses those cameras to zap the life force out of people, making him essentially young and immortal. Our protagonist catches on very fast, as she avoids the mirrors at all costs, but her parents do not, despite her warning causing them to wither away in front of her own eyes. And I think that aspect touches on something very real and terrifying. The fact that no matter what, there will come a day where we will have to bury our own parents. However, this episode plays this for laughs. You get those good old fashioned old people jokes thrown in there, which is a shame because I think if they went more in that direction, they really would have been onto something. Slight redemption though, when we see Pete's homemade graveyard and see the body count of all of his less fortunate victims, which is really dark actually. And Pete's final words of enjoy your youth is a great way to end the episode. The episode just needed to take itself a bit more seriously. The Tale of the Super Specs so, not only am I not particularly fond of this episode, but it also serves as Gary's kind of redemption story after the other members of the Midnight Society have been saying his stories haven't been good lately. So, way to go, Gary. You prove that you'll never be shit. However, this was Sardo's first appearance, and Sardo is Gary's OC, I guess. So, maybe Gary's good for something. Anyways, the story. Basically, there are these glasses that see shadowy figures and... Okay, it's a season one episode, budget probably wasn't much, but they're just dudes in black morph suits. And I'll give them credit, there was an attempt here at making them scary. But then you get this one scene of them fucking ballin', and it's like, okay, that ain't scary. Also, there's this weird subplot about magical powder. Like, this dude sprinkles it in girl's yogurt and then her voice gets really high pitch. He sprinkles it on his basketball and he makes a shot without looking. And it's the reason why these glasses are magical in the first place. But this goes absolutely nowhere. To be fair, the story kind of goes nowhere too. You see, there are no stakes in this story. Like, hey, don't want to see these figures? Then don't put on the glasses. It isn't until literally the last minute where it's revealed there's two parallel universes crashing together and that there could only be one. The one we followed throughout the episode lost because we had Sardo on our team while the other universe had someone who was actually competent with magic. The Tale of Badge. This episode doesn't have much going on beyond the set design and makeup, honestly. This set design is great. You even get these old decaying corpses in the background hanging from nooses. And the makeup on Badge is phenomenal. It's even better up close. But the story? 
Gwen can play the flute and has magical powers because her grandma is a witch, and witch powers are passed down from grandmother to granddaughter. Gwen kind of sucks at it though, because within the first five minutes of realizing she has powers, she lets Badge out of his box, which by all means should mean something, but all Badge really does is talk. He makes all these big claims on what he's gonna do, but never ends up doing any of it. And because of that, this just becomes boring to watch. Oh, and to seal Badge back in his box, all Gwen has to do is play the music notes that are inscribed on the box. It really took her whole episode to piece that little puzzle together. Even then, it's just like five notes she has to play. Like, make it difficult at least. Also, this is the last episode of the original series. Sadly not the best note to go out on. The Tale of C7 Hey, it's another emotional ghost story where the main characters had to reunite two lovers for them to properly move on to the afterlife. Please, I'm tired of it. I get it. It's heartwarming. It's endearing, sweet, touching, but we've done it before. We've done it before. I'll give this one a little more credit because I do think you get some good spooky lighting going on and the setting of a lake house works well in its favor and the pacing's pretty good. It flies by no problem. It's actually infuriating because it is good. I can say this is a good episode, but this is a ranking video. I gotta compare this to all the other episodes collectively. And when there are other episodes doing the exact same thing, then its value is lessened. The Tale of the Dream Machine A kid finds an old typewriter and the first thing he does is write a self-insert fanfic between him and his crush. And based on the story, the dude may or may not be into vampires. I'm not the one to judge. Plus, that's a kid. I'm not really here to speculate what a kid gets his rocks off to. But upon writing the story, whoever was in the story has that exact dream, hence the title. But then, if the story is read out loud, everything written will come true in real life. Which, okay. Easy solution. Don't write scary shit. I mean, is it really that hard? Fuck, I mean, write that you got a million bucks. You guys are sleeping on a get-rich-quick scheme here. Or, and hear me out on this, if you do want to write scary horror shit, then don't insert your friends into it. Okay, that's nitpicking, but they left the door wide open for these kinds of ideas. But what we do end up with is an episode that's not really scary, but is fun. And that goes for the characters. It's a fun group that bounces off each other very well. Well, the acting isn't a hundred percent there, but the chemistry is. The Tale of the Nightly Neighbors It's a simple premise of new neighbors moving in that are not so subtly vampires. They only come out at night and everybody who visits them becomes sick afterwards complete with two small punctures in their neck. The kids actually suspect them of being KGB spies which would have been pretty good if they leaned more in that direction with the Cold War recently ending when this episode came out. But I understand that this is a kids show so whatever. Now I recognize my problem with the episode is entirely my own. You see, since Act 1 it is abundant obvious that the family are vampires, and because the entire episode is focused around these kids trying to prove that they are, the obvious subversion of expectations is for them to turn out that they're not vampires. But if the true ending is that the family isn't vampires, then that wouldn't be a good story, or rather a good scary story to tell around a campfire. So then we predict that, yeah, they're going to reveal that they're not vampires to the kids, but to the audience, they're going to reveal that they are vampires. Long convoluted of saying that this episode was predictable because I watched too much TV. Although, yeah, the parents really aren't vampires. They're servants to the kid who's the true vampire master. It was a solid episode. Just for me personally, it was predictable. The Tale of the Phantom Cab. It's actually the series' first episode, and it's a rough one. It's also Frank's initiation story to see if he could get into the Midnight Society, and I don't know how he got in with this shit. However, we get introduced to our second and final reoccurring character, Dr. Vink. Unlike Sardo, his job description changes constantly. One week he could be a botanist in the woods, the next week he's a filmmaker, the week after that he's a chef. One thing I do like, both for Vink and Sardo, is despite being reoccurring characters, they never overuse them. They're in just enough episodes for it to be exciting when they come on screen. Because if Dr. Vink was the villain in every episode, it would get old fast. 
But yeah, the Phantom Cab. Dr. Fink asks the kids some riddles, and if they can't answer correctly, the Phantom Cab comes and picks them up and drives them straight into a tree. That might seem like nothing, but giving credit where credit is due, Dr. Vink's lab set is really nice and the cab driver is fun to watch. It's just that their fate is dictated on whether or not they can answer a riddle, which is kinda lame. Also, dude, this one child actor in the yellow can't act for shit. I'm not gonna dog on the guy cause he's a fucking kid, but man, I don't know. First episode into this series and I thought all the child actors were gonna be like this kid. Luckily, that wasn't the case. I'm not a loser, and we're not lost. Look, this origin you came up on. The Tale of the Mystic Mirror. This episode is alright. It's a typical lesson on beauty and vanity and how it doesn't matter what you look like on the outside because all that matters is what's on the inside. All that basic shit. We got an old witch who has an appearance of a young lady until her true looks are revealed via a mirror. She turns three girls into dogs because to keep her young appearance, she needs the tongue of three dogs. And I don't know if I missed something while I was watching this, but couldn't she just get three dogs in the pound? Yes, I know, that's horrendous, but logistically, it would be a lot easier. But this episode isn't anything special. It's pretty standard as far as this series goes. This is yet another season five episode, and you can kind of tell they were running out of steam at this point. The Tale of the Midnight Ride Hey, you ever read Legend of the Sleepy Hollow? Well, here it is, except with a modern day teenage high school twist. So it's butchered. And I'm all for modernizing or framing these old gothic horrors in ways that make them watchable or appealing for kids. Cause let's face it, kids ain't gonna go out of their way to read Jane Eyre or Carmilla. But you can sit them down in front of a TV and they'll watch just about anything. As long as it's not C-SPAN. But this episode spends too much time focusing on the high school setting and this love triangle thing. It isn't until the very end where we finally get some good Ichabod Crane action. It's a slow burn and not in the best way. The ending, while good, doesn't make Make up for everything else beforehand. And usually I'm okay with slow buildups, but if the slow buildup is just mundane high school shit, then count me out. The Tale of Locker 22. The scariest thing about this episode is when this chick picks up broken glass with her bare hands. I mean, Jesus Christ, put on some gloves. Nah, but this one's another time travel one, so it's not gonna be good. But here's the thing. While it lacks scares, it is a solid mystery. Basically, our protagonist is assigned to Locker 22, and I wouldn't make a joke about how over the top run down this part of the school is, but that's public school for you. But the last person to have Locker 22 was a girl named Candy who died at school back in the 1960s. So we see our two main characters try to solve the death of how Candy died, and they try to prevent it because they can time travel. It's hard to portray any of this as being frightening when the whole student body is dressed like they're heading to Woodstock after class. Turns out Candy died because there's a gas leak and she lit a Bunsen burner. The two stop them from happening and then when they go back to the present time, Candy is now the vice principal of that school. But the school's still run down though? Like I expected that once they saved her, the school wouldn't be so run down anymore. You know, like Candy's death created bad publicity or even now that Candy's in charge, she could fix up the place. But it just goes to show that the true horror in it all is that public school funding will always be notoriously low no matter what. The Tale of the Prisoner's Past This episode starts off during a tour of an old abandoned prison. There these two brothers find a prisoner still in his cell. Upon releasing him, it turns out he's a ghost. God damn it! It's another fucking ghost story. I'll be lenient though, because it does have some great visuals. And One-Eyed Jack is a cool dude. Like, he's built up to be this scary, ruthless criminal, and to be the only person to ever escape from the prison. But the truth is, he died in the walls trying to escape. And now he has a daughter out there who thinks he abandoned and forgotten about her after he escaped. So One-Eyed Jack gives the boys a photo he's been holding on to all these years to prove he's always cared about her. And the daughter, now an old lady, finally has some closure. Sure, technically, it's an emotional ghost story, and I'm knocking at some points for that, but it's done better than most. Plus, I like these brother characters a lot. They got some good chemistry, and part of them feel like real siblings. The Tale of the Ghastly Grinner. Okay, I feel like I'm in trouble here. 
I feel as if this might be controversial because as someone who never really grew up with the series and as someone who has really only seen a couple of episodes, I have seen this man's face on the internet a lot. Now, of course, I'm making an assumption by correlating iconography with quality. I pray that's the case. I pray that this episode is only as infamous as it is because of the makeup and costume. Because if people actually like the episode because of its story, then I'm going to be crucified in the comments. But let's start off with the good. I love how the comic book store feels like an actual comic book store. Just filled with recognizable comic book characters. And I like the ghastly Grinner's design here. I mean, it is genuinely unnerving and off-putting. Plus, I just love Jester's designs. And whenever the ghastly Grinner makes people laugh, their laughs are creepy. There's like some sort of distortion going on in the voices and it's great. It's eerie. And that's where the compliments end. For you see, all the characters in this episode are just over the top stereotypes. I know it's a comic book related episode and maybe that was intentional, but it just doesn't work. It's a shame too because I always liked how this series doesn't really fall in stereotypical characters. Like sure, a character will be nerdy, but that would be one of their many character traits. Nerdy girl in this episode is just a nerdy girl. She loves being nerdy and frequents on being a girl. That's all there is to her character. Also, I don't know what's up with this episode, but they just escape from the ghastly grinner so easily. <laughs> no joke. They'll be cornered and then just peace out like it was nothing. This happens like three times and it's done so nonchalantly. Like, like, where's the hurry? I mean, to really demonstrate that there's no rush, the climax is literally Ethan having to draw and finish remaining panels of the comic. You know, rough sketch, line art, flat color, shading. This shit takes time. And look, if I'm being honest, the Ghastly Grinner is scary. It's really good makeup, but in motion, it just doesn't seem scary for some reason. And in the end, he's defeated with a big eraser, which... Okay. Now, despite all of its shortcomings, it really is a fun episode to watch. And maybe that's why people like it? Because in all fairness, Are You Afraid of the Dark is much slower than I thought it was coming into this video. So this insane loony shit was a fun change of pace. The Tale of the Prom Queen so this episode is yet again another ghost story and yet again it's about reuniting two lovers to be able to properly pass on. I am however going to be giving a little bit of slack here because it was a season 1 episode. It's the first of its kind. Also, I like the characters. They got some good chemistry and they share some pretty funny scenes together. However, Dee Dee is not so subtly the prom queen ghost. It is abundantly obvious by her reaction at the start of the episode. And I think that's all I really have to say about this episode. Well, actually, in my notes, I wrote nice amount of fog. So yeah, there's a good healthy amount of fog in this episode too. All you fog fans are going to go nuts for this one. The Tale of the Unfinished Painting This episode has a pretty simple story. There's this lady that runs an art studio for young artists. She gives these young artists canvases of other people's work to paint in. And once they sign their name, they get trapped in the paintbrush. But the paintbrush reality space is that of the painting. G God damn it, why couldn't they just make the kids get trapped in the painting itself, a la Super Mario 64 style? But whatever. Oh, and she does all this so that she can take credit for herself, signing her name in the corner where the victims used to be. Which, yes, is an extreme reaction, but I've also seen some people go out of their way to crop out an artist's name on Instagram, so fiction is a reflection of reality in the end of the day. But overall, it's a fine episode. A bit slow to start, and the visuals could have been a lot more surreal and creepy given the wide array of expression the medium of painting has. But at least we got this dumpster burning scene at the end that is pretty graphic. The Tale of the Final Wish so this episode is about fairy tales, which may seem like it's off to a bad start. Like, how are you going to make Cinderella scary? But the truth is, fairy tales, and I mean original fairy tales, are pretty deeply disturbing. So I was pretty on board with the episode, but the problem is that they don't go for the grim fairy tale approach. Instead, our main character makes a wish to have her very own fairy tale, in which she is whisked off to the land of Nod, which is a space controlled by the Sandman, who is more of a fun nihilist character than an actual villain, but it works and his performance is really entertaining to watch. 
My problem, though, is just the entire episode. The girl is stuck in the land of Nod while her family and friends are stuck in perpetual sleep. It's just her crying out how she wants to go back and Sandman saying no. I wish there's more to it, but that's literally it. With that being said, there are some great surreal visuals going on here. All the clock cogs and everybody sleeping while floating midair. It's the perfect visual for a dreamlike land. While it doesn't follow the typical horror-based set design, I can confidently say that the set design for this episode is one of my favorites in the whole series. It unfortunately just needed something a bit more going on story-wise. The Tale of the Magician's Assistant. Gary's the one telling the story here, so of course it's gonna involve magic, which actually, I wanna talk about that real quick. So I talked about how I like the framing device of kids telling stories around a campfire, and because they're all just stories, we get reoccurring characters. But a nice little detail I always like and caught onto really fast was that each member will have a general theme to their stories that are specific to their interests. You know, Gary's stories will always be about magic or cursed objects. Betty Ann's stories tend to have a super supernatural element to them, and Sam's stories are always about love or relationships, and so on and so forth. It's really fun kind of knowing what episodes you're in store for once you know who will be telling it. Which for me personally, I roll my eyes anytime it's Gary's turn. Just because I'm not a fan of horror based magic stuff. Case in point, the episode I'm supposed to be talking about. The Magician's Assistant is about just that, a magician's assistant named Todd, who falls around the great Shandu, who used to be a very big and popular magician, but in recent years is reduced down to doing kids birthday parties. Then and Todd takes one of his wands and accidentally releases an evil magician and whatever. It's not scary and it's not horribly interesting either. It just is. However, I do like the ending. Basically, instead of a giant magic fight, the two just quiz each other on the magician's rule book. It's a fun subversion and I think it works really well. The Tale of the Dark Dragon. This episode sees an unpopular kid named Keith taking a potion to become popular. Of course, it's a children's horror show, so while yes, he does become more confident and popular, he also slowly turns into a dragon. Or, or a wolf? Listen, the episode has dragon in the title, and it would make sense for him to turn into a dragon, but I believe Dark Dragon was the name of the potion? Either way, it doesn't matter much, but it's a solid episode where the transformation is very gradual and the final makeup effects look great. But the majority of the episode is just seeing Keith act like the Canadian Fonzie. But overall, it's a very average episode. The Tale of the Manaha. We got a camping related episode on our hands here, which, yeah, this show doesn't really do camping related episodes. In fact, I believe this is the only one. It's surprising because it seems like such an easy saying to elicit fear from. So we follow a group of scouts and we're immediately hit with stereotypes. I'm talking fat kids, nerdy kids, angry, older counselors, the whole nine yards. Fortunately though, the episode doesn't really focus on them too much, so their lack of characterization is never too big of a problem. This episode is interesting because there's actually no threat. You see, a shaman trapped in a cave releases the beast known as the Manaha, or rather I should say beasts, plural, because there's multiple Manahas. But here's the thing, they're not real, they're just illusions powered by fear, and our protagonist, Jonah, recognizes this and uses the shaman's own personal fear of the creatures to scare him back into the cave. I absolutely love the concept of this episode, the fact that there's no real threat or rather the only threat was fear itself, shout out FDR. But all that being said, Manahal ain't scary by themselves, and this episode's a bit slow. The only saving grace is the aggressive camp counselor Lonnie. He's so over the top, but in a good way. He's like the PG rating equivalent of the drill sergeant from Full Metal Jacket. But overall, great concept, just not the best execution.
The Tale of the Phone Police. I think this episode taps into something special that not only do I think the series needed to do more often, but just children's horror in general. And that's taking irrational and illogical fears children have and making it a reality. I mean, this episode starts off with two kids making a prank phone call. Now, I'm not gonna say every kid growing up made prank phone calls, but I certainly did. My childhood era of YouTube was littered with prank phone call videos, but every time I did make a prank phone call, I had fun, yet I was always scared of getting in trouble. What exactly trouble entailed to, I didn't know. The spectrum was wide. Whether it was my parents scolding me or me getting thrown in jail, for my nine-year-old mind, both outcomes were equally just as probable. And that's the idea that this episode runs with. Jake gets thrown to the slammer via the phone police. It's not abundantly scary outside of the concept. This episode plays this one more as a conspiracy theory thriller than a traditional horror. And I'm totally down for that. I think it works well. And I really love the ending where the two boys aren't even 100% sure if the phone police are real or not. The only problem is that it's really slow at the start, but once it gets going, it's a solid ride. The Tale of Apartment 214. Yet another ghost story on our hands here, but this one's pretty good. We got this old lady in apartment 214 named Madeline and surprise, surprise, she's a ghost. The twist isn't hard to see coming and I think the episode knows that so it doesn't really play it up to be a twist. But Madeline essentially guilt trips and manipulates the girl named Stacy into hanging out with her. Madeline talks about how lonely it is around her place and how all her friends are dead. And we actually get to see a montage of them spending time together over the course of a couple days. We really get the sense that despite the manipulated start of their friendship, it has actually developed into something honest and real. But then one night, Stacy doesn't go to Madeline's, and when she returns, Madeline loses it. The episode's themes are not so subtly about toxic or controlling relationships. It's definitely about friendship in this episode, but you can take the lesson and apply it to a romantic relationship as well. And the ending is great. There's no big battle, no big monster transformation, it's just Madeline and Stacy calmly talking to one another. Madeline apologizes and admits all of her faults. And Stacy even talks about how in some areas, she wasn't 100% in the right either. But they both come to the conclusion that they are better off without each other and that Madeline just needs to move on. And she does. It's a discussion of a premature subject matter disguised as a ghost story. Ironically, the worst parts are the ghost parts because it still is a ghost story at the end of the day. So you gotta go through the whole routine of Stacy trying to piece together the puzzle and nobody believing her and whatnot. Once again, it's pretty standard are you afraid of the dark ghost story shit, but I can't emphasize enough how much it weighs the episode down. The Tale of the 13th Floor. This episode follows two siblings who like to play hockey on the abandoned 13th floor until it turns into this pastel hell of a toy factory. Karen gets invited to test out some new toy products while Billy doesn't, but that doesn't stop Billy from tagging along anyway. Now the toy factory itself is very unsettling for some reason. It's hard to explain why. It's like trying to explain why a liminal space is unnerving. It just is. But very quickly, we learn that the ones running the factory are actually testing kids to see if their body and minds are able to handle the planet's atmosphere. Cause yeah, these bitches are aliens. And one of them is an alien robot? It's it's never really explained. But I gotta give props. These faceless alien designs are so goddamn creepy. It's great. Especially that one shot where there's just a whole group of them looking down on the kids. It's truly some fire in the sky type shit. But let's talk about the ending. I've said it before, but it's not really Are You Afraid of the Dark style to do twist endings, or at least not these big over the top endings out of nowhere. But this episode's got a big old fat twist ending. So the sister was an alien the whole time, and the whole reason why the aliens came to Earth in the first place was to take her back. It's dumb, it's stupid, but because the show doesn't really do stuff like this, it was a real nice treat to see. The Tale of the Closet Keepers Looks like we got back-to-back -back alien episodes here. This time, the aliens in the story are capturing kids from across the world to display them in an alien zoo. The way they go about capturing these kids are through a gun that shoots high-frequency sounds at them. And it's these high-frequency sounds that keep them from escaping. However, our protagonist in the story is deaf. 
yeah we got a deaf lead in this one which is really cool it's nice to see an early 90s show have some form of representation for differently abled people and of course with her being deaf that means the aliens attacks are ineffective on her and she's able to break everybody else out and i don't want to sound nitpicky and i'm definitely not a scientist but the high frequencies should still be able to affect her i mean yeah she can't hear she's deaf but at the end of the day sounds are just vibrations in the air if it's a high enough of a frequency it should do something to her right that's aside the point what we get is a fun semi creepy prison break episode it's a good watch well not being anything too remarkable the tale of the lonely ghost yep we got another emotional, heartwarming ghost story here. It's only the third episode of the entire series, but once again, the same shit gets tiring. Basically, this nanny character is used as a red herring. There's something off-putting about her, and she's kind of built up to be the villain, but it turns out she was just grieving over the loss of her daughter. Meanwhile, next door, there's an abandoned house that is haunted by a little girl. Gee, I wonder where this is going. So yeah, to the surprise of nobody, the little girl is the nanny's dead daughter. They meet up again and they pass on together. Now, all things considered, this ending is very sweet and touching. Seeing the two of them playing in the mirror is nice, and the nanny's performance of meeting her daughter again is legitimately heart-clenching. I don't mean to downplay just how good this episode truly can be. I just want to put extra emphasis on the fact that these kinds of stories are overplayed in the series. And this episode did originally rank just a little bit higher, but once again, I I gotta compare every episode to every episode to properly rank them. And this kind of structure has been done to death. The Tale of the Vacant Lot This is another solid episode. A mysterious merchant appears in a vacant lot and offers items to Catherine for free. Each item enhances her social status in some way. Like the first item she gets are shoes that make her run really fast, which she uses to join the track team. But the more items she gets, the more, let's call them blemishes, appear on her body. Which, credit to the makeup department once again, it uses some very grotesque makeup effects. It's very much a coming of age story about what we value most, which apparently is looks. Listen. If I got shoes that made me run really fast at the cost of my physical appearance, great. Being ugly wouldn't matter if I had 10 Olympic gold medals under my belt. There are opportunities to cash in on this, and I'm taking full advantage. And besides, if I really did care about my looks, it wouldn't matter because I'd be running so fast nobody could see how ugly I truly am. Or shit, kick me up in makeup, there's ways around this shit. I digress. It's a solid story with a good message and gross makeup effects. The Tale of Laughing in the Dark It's a clown episode, so I can see how for a lot of people this might rank higher on their lists. But truth be told, I'm just not that scared of clowns. I think there's a slight creepiness to them all, but other than that, I'm more just a fan of their overall design and aesthetic. And I mean, personal stuff aside, the episode doesn't do much to make Zebo the Clown all that frightening. He does have a tragic backstory, as Zebo the Clown was an actual person who burned to death in the hall of mirrors due to one of his cigars that he's so famous for smoking. And now Zebo's soul resigns in an animatronic clown, which is pretty creepy looking, I can't lie. And any part of the carnival is equally eerie and creepy. It's due to a mixture of design and lighting that really brings this place to life. But other than that, the episode's pretty tame. You see, Josh steals the nose off Zebo as a bet he makes with his friend. After that, Zebo haunts him and tells him to return the nose, and that's it. I mean, he turns his dinner into a bunch of cigars and steps into pudding he spilled, but other than that, those are the only physical threats made by Zebo. So Josh returns the nose, and a whole carton of cigars? Where the fuck did he get that from? He's either got a fake ID on him, or his dad's got a hidden cigar stash. But then that's it. The episode is still good, just my personal bias of not finding clowns scary gets in the way here. The Tale of the Dream Girl. So, this episode is essentially The Sixth Sense five years before The Sixth Sense. We follow our main character, Johnny, who, hey, is actually dead and is a ghost. And the same goes for this girl, Donna. Donna and Johnny dated and both died in a car accident together. So, while the episode starts off as a mystery with Johnny trying to figure out who Donna is and why she's flirting with him, it's slowly revealed that he's a ghost and this heartbreaking scene where Johnny's sister tells him that only she can see him. 
And as much as she hates the idea of Johnny not being around anymore, she ultimately encourages her brother to move on. I mean, so yeah, it's technically an emotional ghost story yet again. But this time the main character is the ghost, and that's kind of cool. We also get to learn more about him because of that. Also, because I only watched this one once, I imagine this one's better on rewatch with the knowledge gain of Johnny being dead. But overall, the pacing is good, and the little twist is legitimately one I didn't see coming. The Tale of the Dollmaker. This is a good episode. Melissa visits her aunt and uncle's house and is disappointed to learn that the neighbor girl, Susan, and her family moved away. But then it's revealed that her family moved away because Susan went missing. Hmm. Looks like we got another mystery episode on our hands here. What's this episode called again? The Tale of the Dollmaker? Okay, okay. Let's see if we can piece this together ourselves. Okay, okay. And, uh... There's a dollhouse in the attic? Oh, okay, okay, well, well, Susan's trapped in the dollhouse then. While yes, my cynical and jaded prediction does ring true, it doesn't take away from the episode. Because what we're left with is a creepy dollhouse that slowly turns its inhabitants into lifeless dolls. And that alone is creepy in its own right. Plus, the episode has really good pacing. Some Are You Afraid of the Dark episodes are really slow and don't really pick up until the last five minutes. Sometimes the last five minutes make up for everything else, and sometimes they don't. But this episode actually develops really fast, and I really appreciate it for that. The Tale of Train Magic. Now, I think what really gets me about this episode is the emotions behind it. You see, you have this little boy named Tim who loves trains, like absolutely obsessed with trains. And whatever, he's a kid, kids like trains. But some people, like his older brother Hank, think it's an unhealthy obsession. Pretty par for the course. There's always one dickhead character in these episodes, either a sibling or a friend. But then we find out why Tim loves trains. It's because his dad was a conductor, and his dad passed away. In a sense, Tim's obsession with trains is a way of coping with his father's death, as there's no figure there to connect with anymore. Tim develops a love for trains as that shared love will connect the two spiritually. And Hank, in his own right, is suffering too. He's not telling Tim to stop playing with his trains because he thinks he's too old. He's telling him to stop playing with trains because no matter what, it's not going to bring their father back. And you can say I'm completely overreading the situation, but the two literally get in an argument and Hank says exactly that. But then the rest of the story is a bunch of ghost train bullshit and I don't care. I mean, really. This is only up this far because I was not expecting such a deep characterization or mature subject matter. And no, they don't water it down by making their dad a ghost. Their dad is just dead, plain and simple, and I respect them for keeping it that way. The Tale of Old Man Kokoran. We start off with two brothers moving to a new house, and right off the bat, I like these two. They got some good chemistry, some witty lines, and they don't argue enough to feel like real brothers, but it's close. And in an attempt to fit in with the neighborhood kids, they decide to play hide and seek in the graveyard at night. Cause, you know, any new friend group you join as a kid, you gotta do some spooky scary shit as an initiation. At least according to these types of shows, like, like, like honestly, growing up, have y'all ever had to do some scary shit just to hang out with some people? Like, common if so, cause I'm generally curious what that's actually like. <laughs> Anyways, the kids tell the brothers the story of Old Man Kokorin, the harmonica ghost. One thing leads to another, and the two brothers break into Kokorin's abandoned house to steal their harmonica. Except, oh shit, the house isn't actually abandoned. And double oh shit, Kokorin isn't a ghost. He's just a normal ass old dude. And then you get the reveal that the group of kids were the ghosts all along. Which is not a bad twist. I only pieced it together near the end when it was borderline obvious. Overall, good characters, good twist, decently scary, but it was slow all things considered, but that's about it. The Tale of the Twisted Claw you guys know how monkey paws work, right? Essentially, you make a wish and you'll get that wish. However, with usually some dire consequences. Well, that's essentially what this episode is. Just replace a monkey's paw with a bird's talon. I actually like how this one's set up. You see, in my time of watching Are You Afraid of the Dark, I've noticed magical shit just happens without explanation sometimes. Which is fine, I don't need an explanation for everything. And by all means, whatever gets us to the central plot quickest, do it. But this episode actually has some setup for it. These kids actually spray this old Old witch in the face with some shaving cream causing her to stumble back and break her vase. And I'm not trying to sound mean by calling her an old witch. She really is an old witch. 
Well then, Halloween rolls around, and these two chuckle nuts think it'd be a great idea to go trick-or-treating at her place. They do, and they get the Twisted Claw as a gift. And you know how it goes from here. They don't believe it, they make a couple accidental wishes, and then they slowly believe in its powers. But there are horrible consequences to their wishes. Like, Kevin wants to beat this absolute Chad named Bostic in a school race. So, he wishes to beat him. And yeah, he beats him, but Bostic breaks his leg during the race. That's all fine and good, but then Kevin accidentally wishes Dougie would lose his parents and then the fucking police chief calls up the house phone and tells him that his parents have been in a car crash <laughs> like holy shit dude it got intense fast but then right after that dougie wishes his grandpa to come back to life and the zombie grandpa slowly starts walking towards the door eventually they wish to fix the old lady's vase thus undoing all the effects of the twisted claw but this is a good episode it's pretty slow to start like really slow but then the last five minutes are just something else The Tale of the Renegade Virus A show from the 90s wouldn't be complete without an episode about VR. I don't know why every 90s show had a VR related episode. I mean, it's not like the Virtual Boy was a big hit or anything, but I digress. The whole point of the episode is that Simon's teacher finishes building a VR system and he wants Simon to test it. Now, this teacher is a super genius. He literally gets a call from the President of the United States in this episode. Why he decides to stay teaching middle school is beyond me. However, Simon's friend uploads a virus into the game to mess with Simon. Now, to be fair, Simon was a total dickhead at the start of the episode, so he had it coming. The virus gains sentience and tries to live on in real life by going to Simon's brain. If this played out more seriously and there weren't all these wacky shenanigans, this could have been a Black Mirror episode. But yeah, this one's not too scary on the surface. It's more conceptually scary than anything else. Like a computer virus being uploaded to your brain? What does that do? What does that entail to? I also just wish they took more advantage of the VR setting. Like in Simon's virtual world, why the fuck are we just back in his house? But yeah, I had my fun with this episode and I would consider it good, just not great. The Tale of a Door Unlocked you know, the more I watched season 5, the more worried I got, because I knew this was their last season, in the OG run at least, and I haven't seen a particular character in a while, that character being Sardo, but by god he has returned, and this is actually his last appearance sadly. Anyways, Sardo sells a kid a small wooden door, in it, Justin sees a girl he's never seen before trapped in a burning building. He finds it strange until he goes to school and meets the new girl, who is the girl he saw in the door, and then we get a bunch of segments of Justin acting like a psycho, like warning her about fire randomly out of nowhere, trying to put out a fire on some birthday candles, and freaking out when she puts on a jacket because it's the same jacket from the vision he saw. Meanwhile, these rugrats are in a haunted house having their typical scary friend group initiation. Seriously, why is this shit so commonplace? But because they're kids and they're stupid, they end up setting the old abandoned house on fire at the exact moment Ashley walks in looking for her brother. Then Justin finds a key on the side of the door which unlocks the door fully, which then transports himself into the burn building and then Sardo actually has two doors and opens the second one helping Justin and Ashley escape from the burning building. Me summarizing this doesn't do it justice because in actuality there's never really a dull moment. The pacing really keeps and builds the intensity really well. I will admit the door shit doesn't make a whole lot of sense or rather it doesn't follow any rules because in the start it's predicting the future and in the end it's used to teleport but putting that aside you are left with an episode that was able to keep my attention throughout the whole thing which is a hard thing to say for the last Last season. The Tale of the Whispering Walls this episode has a lot going for it. You got a great creepy house set design going on here, and you got Gerard Way from the Black Parade as a villain. When I was okay, if I play more of that, this video is going to get taken down. But yeah, it's pretty much standard haunted house type story just executed very well. The unfortunate souls that wander in this house will be trapped and become part of the house. And the house, because it has enough trapped souls, is actually alive. And that's great. And that's creepy. And yeah, that's Monster House, kinda. But there's so Something has been bothering me about this episode, and it might be my fault. I might have missed something or didn't fully get something. To be fair, it was an episode I watched while I spilled booberry 
spray all over myself and had to deal with cleaning that up. But I swear to God, the ghost weakness in this episode is fucking wind. I'm not going to harp on it too much because I'm not 100% sure if that's it, but I swear to God it's what I saw. I wrote it down in my notes with five question marks because I'm not so sure. But the ending is nice. The kids and babysitter escape and peel out of there. And almost like clockwork, another car breaks down in front of the house, showing the cycle will continue. The Tale of the Guardian's Curse we got a mummy episode here. I think mummies are cool, not scary, but I think this one works because it's more of an espionage adventure type episode that just so happens to have scary elements to it. So by having the horror elements act as a backdrop rather than the main focus, it works a lot better for me personally. The plot sees a dad whose team uncovers a new mummy. At first, it seems simple. The kids notice the mummy is gone when they check back in on it, but over time, it's actually revealed that a rival professor wants the mummy for himself. Well, not so much for the mummy, but more so for the ring that is buried with. So all the mummy being alive shit was just this dude snatching the body. So he gets the ring that said to grant immortality, and it does, but he also becomes a statue. A, a fitting fate, but then, oh shit, guess what? The mummy is actually alive. They give it a potion, and it returns to its youthful self. There's really not much more I can add here. It's a good, solid episode, which I didn't really expect from a mummy episode. The Tale of the Quiet Librarian. So this episode opens with kids opening doors and screaming, but then something weird happens. The scream just cuts off halfway through. I thought it was a glitch at first or just a problem with my laptop, but no, it happens one more time and becomes abundantly clear that this is what they're going for. The librarian herself is capturing the voices of these young children, and I thought that was so cool and creative. Unfortunately, the episode doesn't take enough advantage of this premise as I would have liked them to, but it's good enough. But the way to defeat the librarian who can steal sound not just from humans but just objects in general is to just make a bunch of sounds? That's it? She's literally just defeated by the two protagonists throwing shit around. The one power she has is to mute sound, yet she is defeated by sound? I get that's supposed to be ironic, but I just wish there's a more creative way to deal with her. Also, I just gotta give a quick shout out to these kids trapped in the quiet reading room covered in cowwebs. It's a great creepy visual that actually kind of caught me off guard when I first watched the episode. The Tale of the Bookish Babysitter I'll be honest, this episode isn't very scary, like even in the slightest, but it's been able to rank this high simply because of how fun it is. We got this kid named Ricky who's dressed like he's about to give your favorite album a light to decent six, who is getting babysitted by Belinda, who's a witch. She is touted as being one of the best babysitters for, I guess, fixing problem children. Ricky's problem is that he sits in front of the couch and watches TV all day. I say this as a problem as if I didn't just binge watch this entire show. Anyways, Belinda's secret is that she makes kids read from her witch books, thus bringing monsters from the books into real life. But because Ricky is an overstimulated kid, he starts and stops every single book in her collection. So this dude and his ADD brings like several monsters into life. They run amok in the house and then he goes into a book to fight the final boss. It's just a really fun fucking story. And the monsters, while not scary, are just straight up fun. And Belinda, she really steals the show. She's so charismatic and full of life. It'd be easy to make her the old stereotypical witch, but nah, she's this fun young Sabrina the Witch type witch. And the pacing is fantastic too. It never really lets off the gas. If I have a slight nitpick, it's that the final boss fight inside the book itself isn't as great as seeing the monster stuff around the house. It's always fun to see monsters interact in a house, because a house is a sacred and familiar territory. Having that bitch filled with monsters gives it more of a threat. Unfamiliar creatures in a familiar setting equals good. Unfamiliar creatures in an unfamiliar setting equals not as good. The Tale of Watcher's Woods This episode is about a forest demon who traps people who wander into Watcher's Woods in a sort of woodland purgatory. Years ago, three girls went missing, and with people being rational, they thought it was just three girls that went missing. 
But it isn't until our two protagonists, Sarah and Kelly, end up in that neck of the woods where they do see that the three are actually still alive, just trapped. This episode just has a great atmosphere to it all. I think it's partially due to its great lighting. There are some fantastic colors going on in the lighting department, and just the set design in general, and uh, yeah. <laughs> It's a good episode that I don't have much to talk about, honestly. The Tale of the Full Moon Now this one's a bit different from any of the other episodes. In feel, in tone, and just in the general vibe, things are different. And I think that's because this one is very campy feeling. And that's not a diss. The episode is clearly trying to go for that vibe. As far as I can tell, this episode takes place in the 90s, but stylistically shares some resemblance with more of a 1950s aesthetic. And it's not just some stylistic random choice, because in my opinion, this episode feels very much like a B-movie from the 50s. And that's great. It breaks up the typical formula and leaves the audience with a new experience. The plot in the episode revolve around a kid named Jed who desperately wants a dog. Jed's mom, on the other hand, wants herself a man. Now, Jed runs a pet detective agency, and when working on one case, he sees his neighbor turn into a werewolf. Of course, nobody believes him, but then guess what? The mom starts dating the neighbor, and Jed disapproves because, well, he's a fucking werewolf. But the situation can easily be read as an allegory for kids of divorce disapproving their mom's dating life. It's very hard for children to accept a new parental figure in their life, and I think addressing the situation by dressing it up as a werewolf story is very fun. But that doesn't exactly turn out to be the case, because the neighbor across the street actually has a twin brother, and that brother is the werewolf. Which, just great costume and makeup for the werewolf. But in the end, they all just accept each other for who they are. It's a great story about what family means and how even strangers with no blood connections can be family as long as you approach them with the same amount of love respect and understanding of a real family. Oh, and the werewolf kind of acts like Jed's dog. Jed even says how he finally got the pet dog that he wanted. It raises the question about humanity because yes, while he is a beast, he's still a human underneath, but this is played more as a lighthearted campy ending more than anything, so whatever. The Tale of the Fire Ghost. I guess we got back-to-back -back episodes here that deal with divorce as a subject matter. That's always fun. But after Jimmy and Roxy's parents split up, the two develop content for their dad, as he's a firefighter and never gets to spend time with them. And I think the conversation between these characters are unflinchingly real and heavy. Jimmy and Roxy feel as if they're not loved by their father anymore, and even pins the divorce on him because he never makes time for anyone even. Of course, this isn't close to the truth, it's just a case of misunderstanding. The kids don't fully comprehend what the duty of a firefighter entails. The station gets a call leaving the kids alone. During the time alone, they run into a firefighter named Jake, who seems pretty chill. But then they also run into the fire ghost, whose powers and looks are exactly what you think they are. We then learn about Jake. Yeah, he's a ghost too. So then we get this cool setup where it's like good ghost versus evil ghost. I mean, the two don't go head to head. Jake acts more like a mentor, but still. Now the fire ghost can cast fire. No shit, right? It was actually pretty cool, and the fire ghost himself has a fun personality behind him, but you want to take a wild guess on how the fire ghost is defeated? I'll give you five seconds, on the clock starting right now, it's fucking water. And sure, it's ironic that the kids tricked him into setting off the water sprinklers, but any entity that can die from me opening up a shaking can of LaCroix is a bitch. I just wish there was a more clever way of dealing with this guy, because other than that, it's a good episode. The tale of the room for rent. Well, here we are again. I'm stuck talking about yet another emotional ghost story. And it's got all the classic staples. It's got a love triangle, a misunderstanding that's keeping the presence of a ghost tethered to this world, and finally, ending with closure, laying the dead properly to rest. But why does this one rank so high? It cracked the top 20. It's gotta do something special, have a different take, a new twist, explore a new idea or concept. But the truth is, it doesn't. It's the same old tired story just with a slightly different framing device to differentiate itself between all the others. So why does this one rank so high? Why does it rank higher than the rest? Simply put, it's the execution. There's not a single bad performance. Everybody's putting 110%. The emotional scenes are emotional. Which, for the record, this is a late season 4 episode. I was more than worn out with the format and I was still able to feel something. 
and it's all thanks to these actors. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, it still is this overdone emotional ghost story bullshit, so I'm knocking it points. Now, don't get me wrong, it wouldn't have cracked the top 10, but it definitely would have ranked higher if there weren't so many of these episodes already. The Tale of Jake and the Leprechaun by all means, this one shouldn't have ranked that high. I'm not super into fantasy stuff in general, less so fantasy based horror. And I couldn't tell you why. No disrespect to the genre, I just could never get into it. Maybe because the majority of media I consumed growing up were sci fi in some way? I don't know. But that's besides the point. The first thing I actually want to talk about is the Midnight Society itself. You see, before the story, there are these intros with the Midnight Society. It's usually just members coming together and the storyteller setting of the story. There are trivial arguments amongst the bunch and even ongoing stories between the members. They're cute, but I didn't put too much investment into this stuff. Hell, by the end, I just utilized that time to go up and grab some snacks or go to the bathroom. That's how little I cared by the end. And the writers know this. They know the show is episodic and nobody's tuning in to see the developing romance between Sam and Gary, which is a real ongoing plotline, by the way. And as far as his ranking is concerned, I've been judging the stories by themselves and not so much the banter between the Midnight Society. But I want to put a spotlight on this episode specifically because the story is told by Eric. Now, Eric wasn't supposed to tell the story that night, but once Gary heard the news that his grandpa passed away, he gave him the floor. Even then, Eric says this story is the one his grandpa used to tell him all the time. It's actually a really sweet moment, and it's even sweeter when you account for the fact that Eric's a fucking dickhead, and nobody really likes him. But the Midnight Society were able to put away their differences and allow him to share his story in honor of his grandpa. And of course, none of this factors into the ranking. I just want to talk about it because I thought it was really endearing. But hey, the episode! We got a famous actor putting on a play about some fantasy bullshit, but it's all just one big facade, as Gort himself is a banshee and wants to turn little Jake over here into a leprechaun. Jake teams up with an actual leprechaun named Sean to ultimately stop and kill Gort live on stage, and that's it. It may not seem that great, but I cannot stress just how good the pacing and banter is in this episode. Once again, I don't care for fantasy stuff, and I was glued to the screen the whole time because the story just keeps moving and really never slows down. And Sean is so cool, yet a hardened character. He acts as Jake's mentor, essentially. And the makeup effects? Gort taking off his human disguise is so disgusting, in a good way. And maybe I'm giving this episode more credit than it deserves because my standards were just on the floor. But even so, I walked away satisfied. The Tale of the Crimson Clown I guess this is the most comparable to Laughing in the Dark on the simple premise that they both feature clowns, but that's really it. I don't think it's fair to directly compare the two. Two totally different stories and messages being presented here. I'm basically saying all this as a cushion because I have a gut feeling that people like the Zebo episode more than this one. But why? Because Zebo is a scarier design than the Crimson Clown? Because that's really the only thing that I can think about that is better in that episode. Okay, the major thing you gotta know about this episode that's Sam is a fucking prick. He's constantly throwing his brother Mike under the bus. I'm talking about stealing money from him and using it to buy a video game. Money, might I add, that was going to be used to buy a Mother's Day gift. Then, when they get home late, this fucker just places the blame on Mike. Sure, there are token asshole characters in a majority of the episodes who get what they deserve, but I have never been so infuriated with a character until this guy showed up. So Mike just completely makes up an entire story about the Crimson Clown. I mean, yeah, it's not much of a story. Mike just says, that the Crimson Clown comes after bad kids. And yeah, that's all that happens, pretty much. Sam sees a glimpse of him in his bedroom and then, oh hey, a Sonic 2 poster. And then gradually shows up more and more until it's a full-on chase. And I gotta show off this great scene where the Crimson Clown's unnaturally outstretched arm comes out of the TV. That's straight up a scene out of the new It films. A minor criticism is that the Crimson Clown in the full body suit, he kind of looks like the Jack in the Box mascot. Now, I love that mascot design, don't get me wrong, but it's not at all scary. But the franticness of this episode once it really gets started more than makes up for it. The Tale of the Silent Servant It's a shame there's not a lot of horror stories based on scarecrows. Or maybe there's like a whole subgenre of horror books out there that are. I mean, I wouldn't know after all. I'm illiterate. I'm typing this script out in wingdings. But I say this because scarecrows are legitimately terrifying based on the design alone. And I'm not talking about the cutesy Trader Joe fall time decorative scarecrows. I'm talking about the real deals. And that's the one thing this episode captures really well. This scarecrow costume looks amazing. It is a bit of a shame we don't get to see an emotion all that much. But 
but what we do get is good enough for this to be a great episode. Basically, these two kids do some voodoo shit that brings the scarecrow to life, and they can command it to do anything. However, it only comes to life and does the work at night when nobody's around, and it works like a charm. It does all their chores around the farm. However, the scroll from which they read states to be careful because it's said to be evil. So it starts a great debate between Jared and Anne. Jared says, how can it be so bad if it does everything we tell it to do? Well, Anne just points out that the warning isn't there as one big goof. Either way, one of them accidentally commands it to kill whoever has their baseball glove, which just so happens to be their dad. I don't know what it is with these kids in these stories who essentially have wishes just carelessly saying shit like that. It happened in the Twisted Claw and it happened here again. And it's with this final command that we finally see the Scarecrow in action. And it's done really well, just bathed in dark shadows. It's great. My only real problem is that this episode is a bit slow, which is fine at the start because these two kids debating on the legitimacy of the evil claim is great the first time around. After a while, they both have made their points and they're not developing any new ones, so they just repeat themselves. But other than that, it's a great watch. The Tale of the Dangerous Soup I'll admit something, as far as scares in the story go, this one's solid. It's nothing amazing, but it's definitely not terrible. But what makes me enjoy this one so much is its setting, as this story takes place at a restaurant. So as the name implies, there's a restaurant with a highly sought after soup. Like that's all people order from this place. Like why are there so many goddamn cooks in the kitchen if all you're serving is soup? However, each customer is only limited to one serving. But I mean, how good could this soup really be? It looks watery, there's no meat or veg. And if I can't dip my grilled cheese into it and enjoy myself, then it's not a soup I want to hang out with. But surprise, surprise, Dr. Vink is the head chef. I like how this episode handles Dr. Vink, actually. I mean, he's not Sardo. Sardo was a comic relief character. If he showed up in an episode, you knew it'd be funny. But Dr. Vink always plays these villains. So if he shows up in an episode, then there you go. There's the bad man for the episode. In a way, it can take away from the buildup. We know what his character is all about, unlike in his first episode, where we he didn't know who he was exactly, so the flip to bad meant something. But in this episode, they are fully aware of that. We don't get to see the head chef. He shot just out of frame. So while the audience are trying to theorize on what's going on, when it's revealed that Dr. Vink is behind everything, it's a big revelation. And I like that. As far as what makes the soup good, it's fear. Dr. Vink has a gargoyle that projects your fears in front of your eyes. And it's pretty standard shit like snakes and whatnot. But Reed's fear is his uncle. Reed had an abusive uncle who passed away. And even though he's gone now, he he still fears his presence. That's pretty heavy and a complex real fear to have. Once again, I thought we were just gonna get standard shit like spiders, clowns, and the IRS, but what we got through Reed was a personal struggle, one of which we get to see him overcome, and that's great. You watch enough whatever episodes of this show and you forget that they can punch you in the gut still. The Tale of the Hungry Hounds. Okay, I'm gonna have some explaining to do, cause it starts off really dumb. Pam's dead horse jockey aunt's ghost possesses her body. Now stick with me on this. Yes, that's dumb. But if you can get past it, what you're left with is probably one of the show's most brutal stories. Basically, Pam's aunt, along with her stable keeper, were eaten alive by a bunch of hungry hounds as if they forgot to feed them. Now all this is told through one big monologue, which is kind of lame, but obviously they can't show any of it. It'd be too graphic, but I'm actually okay with this, because not only does the actress put on one hell of a performance, but the soundtrack? It's hauntingly beautiful, whimsical and dreamlike, yet poignant and melancholic. But of course, our characters relive this very situation, and it's great. Pam, still possessed by her aunt, slowly inches closer and closer to the barn door to let the hounds in, almost in a trance-like state. Meanwhile, Amy is fighting for her life to get the dog food out in time. In the end, a little fox, which was mentioned in the monologue, sacrifices itself and leads the hounds away. And I don't know, I just found this one both tragically and graphically beautiful. And I'll admit, the first couple episodes of season one weren't doing a whole lot for me. So when this one came around, I was pretty impressed.
The Tale of Cutter's Treasure, Part 1. This story is so big and grand that two people have to tell it. So Frank and Gary team up and deliver the show's only two-part episode, at least in the OG run. Now, as you probably noticed, I'm going to be ranking each part separately, which some may find odd because in my Goosebumps video, I made it a point to count two parters as one. Well, truth be told, that move was done out of necessity. Goosebumps had a bunch of two-part episodes, but this show's only got one, so why not? And if you really care, you can see where I rank the second part and split the difference for its true ranking. But this story's about pirates, goddammit, and I love pirates. Now, this is only part one, meaning that this episode is just all set up for the action shit in part two. And while that is true, somehow it still works. I think because the writers knew they didn't have to set up and resolve the story within 20 minutes, it gave them much more time to build on these characters, the world, and just focus on having really good pacing. And shit goes down at the very end when these pirates roll up, which is such a cool sequence, and they just kidnap Max and leave the ending on a good cliffhanger. Also, this is the only episode, or rather episodes, that featured both Dr. Vink and Sardo together, which is really fucking cool. And I'll tell you why. Dr. Vink is Frank's original character that he came up with. Sardo is Gary's original character that he came up with. And because both of them are telling a story, it makes sense. It truly feels like both of these characters are telling the story because of that. But we'll talk more about this story in just a bit. The Tale of the Hatching So we got a boarding school episode that's not so subtly run by monsters. I mean, there's just something off about them, and they have this weird rule about not being able to play music. And when one does play music, they act as if they're in pain. So yeah, they're clearly monsters of some kind. Maybe aliens, new wave vampires, but nah, try lizard people. Their whole plan is to brainwash these kids and to unknowingly take care of their eggs until they're ready to hatch. The way they achieve this brainwashing is by feeding these kids this food called sponge. It's spelled like this. It doesn't look the greatest, but apparently it tastes great. It's served as a dessert. The one time being a picky eater pays off though, because Augie and Jasmine do not partake in the communal sponge, thus do not get brainwashed, thus get to see what's really going on. And in the end, the day is saved by music in a, quite frankly, gory way. Like, this scene is just the alligator segment in Resident Evil 2. And all the eggs just explode too. Well, Except for one. Gotta have that ambiguous ending after all. But I think this is just a really good episode. It's creepy not knowing what's going on. And then it turns into terrifying once the monsters are revealed. And then it's got a bit of action at the end. I would also say there's a bit of a mystery component in there too, but it's pretty obvious to figure out what's going on. But other than that, it not only has a bit of everything going on, but it does everything very well. The Tale of the Unexpected Visitors. This one is just straight up fun, and you know it's gotta be pretty fun to even rank this high, but it's essentially Bill and Ted meets aliens. While Jeff is played more down to earth and is the level headed rational one here, Perch is definitely as early 90s airhead as you can get. But these two are in a band, and Jeff's dad is a satellite scientist and has his very own workstation in the house. So of course, Perch takes the opportunity to send some music out into space, and I swear to god it's a knock off the X-Files theme. I think it's meant as an homage to the show if anything. Anyways, so aliens pick up this message and come to Earth. Nothing truly scary happens here. I mean, when the aliens use these golden shiny webs to snatch people up, it's not exactly scary. Plus, how do you even get caught in this thing? It's dark outside and these things are literally shiny. But I can just not stress enough how funny this episode is. Perch really steals the show and of course, it's only exemplified by Jeff's dichotomy. In the end, it was just all one big misunderstanding. These aliens native language is actually music, or rather sound waves and notes that are the equivalent of what people on Earth would refer to as music. Turns out the little jam sesh Perch shot out into space was basically a distress call for aliens. What are the odds? Also, I really love these alien designs. Having more of a corporeal light form is a take I've never really seen on aliens before. If you go into this episode looking for scares, you'll be disappointed. But if you just want to watch an episode and have a good time, this one's for you. The 
The Tale of the Midnight Madness. As someone who loves film and just everything about cinema in general, this is a really great episode. Pete is an employee of this old movie theater. In recent times, the theaters have been struggling getting sufficient funds and keeping the business going. Not enough people coming in, and because not enough people come in, they can't afford big Hollywood movies. No big blockbuster means no customers. You see the vicious cycle here. So the theater is set to shut down within a month, and Pete tries to save it, handing out and posting flyers all over, extra friendly to the customers, and not because he needs the job. This is all down out of love and appreciation for the cinema going experience. All seems lost until Dr. Vink shows up and offers his film to be played in the theater, which it's just no Nosferatu, but it, it's a big hit. People love it. They find it legitimately scary, which I mean, it's a good film, a staple of the silent era, and a titan in the German expressionism genre. It's good, ignoring the anti-Semitic symbolism, but I don't think that kind of film would be captivating to modern audiences, or even early 90s audiences. But Dr. Vink didn't give this to the theater for free. He had a deal after all. He states in that deal that once the theater decides to play Nosferatu, and once it proves to be popular, the theater must play another film by him of his choosing at least once a week. Now that sounds like a fair deal. Hell, good. Hell, great deal. I mean, it's through his horror film that got people coming into the theater again, so surely his other films would do the same. But the theater's manager doesn't iron their deal because now that they're making money again, he can finally get some A-list movies. Which, real quick, the manager character is something else. Early on, when he's facing money troubles, he straight up pulls out a flask and knocks one back. I know this is a Canadian series, but I'm still surprised on what they're allowed to get away with on a kid's show. So anyways, Nosferatu comes out of the picture. Now, unfortunately, Nosferatu, he's not really much of a threat outside of appearance, but that's fine because he's legitimately frightening. And then it all ends when Pete goes into the movie himself in this really simple yet effective uh, effect. There he beats him and then that's that. This episode is almost a love letter to cinema. The characters are fun and real and share some great chemistry. The pacing is just amazing and the ending is a little scary. Well, not really, but it's super fun and creative, and I couldn't help but smile. The Tale of Cutter's Treasure Part 2 Yep, I already set this one up previously. And because this episode doesn't really have to worry about setting up characters or the world that much, they can just hit the ground running with this one. And it's great. You got talking skeletons, a great set, and a really good emotional brother scene. In the second part, we truly get to see Captain Cutter, who is a rough pirate who just doesn't give a fuck. Man literally takes a drink mid-battle like it's nothing. But in the end, Rush, yes, that's his name, is faced with a dilemma. To kill Captain Cutter or to not. I mean, he is a villain that that came down to his brother, plus he's already dead, his skeleton's in the corner. But you know, the act of killing is a big moral question here. Ultimately, Rush sees through Captain Cutter's plan. Cutter wants to die. He wants to be killed so his soul can finally move on because right now, he's stuck forever guarding his treasure. So yeah, Rush doesn't give him the sweet release of death and pieces out. And then the episode just ends with a meta joke between Sardo and Dr. Vink talking about being in the same place at the same time. It's great. It's a good episode. It's cute. The Tale of the Pinball Wizard. How can an episode about pinball be scary? Well, look at this fucking pinball machine. I never thought I would have to use the term uncanny valley to describe a pinball machine, but Ross gets trapped in this pinball machine and has to get out. That's it, but what we get is a very surreal landscape. The pinball machine itself is just the mall setting, which fair enough, but it's filled with these dreamlike entities, like a group of dudes in suits who say nothing and have no expressions on their face. Also, this episode has a standout soundtrack. It's video game music inspired. And usually when TV shows or movies try to make their own video game music, it doesn't sound close to the real thing. It's either too simplistic or they just straight up record the whole song normally and then bit crush it. But not here. It feels like they actually got a video game composer to make music for this episode. And same goes for the sound effects, because this episode is loaded with video game sound effects. So yeah, even though it's supposed to be pinball, it plays more like a video game, which is fine and it really works. It's just a really fun, creative, surreal episode. It doesn't give you those spooky kind of scares. It's more so off-putting and strange than anything, but through and through, it's a fantastic episode. The Tale Station 109.1 
First off, we yet again got another character played by young Ryan Gosling. Just had to get that out of the way because he was also in a Goosebumps episode. But we follow our character Chris, who is obsessed with death. Like, I know kids tend to hyperfixate on literally anything, but my man over here is sleeping around a bouquet of flowers to emulate a funeral. So anyways, then Chris accidentally picks up an off-dial radio frequency designed to usher the wayward deceased onto the afterlife. He finds the actual location to just check it out and is slapped with a number bracelet. When the number is called, it's his time to move on. So it's within this setting do we see the true horror that passing on can be for others. We get these people who freak out and say it's not their time, not accepting the fact that the reality is no more. And one of these dudes just straight up goes to hell. It's not explicitly said of course, but it's heavily implied. So all of this is already very good on its own, but then you get the legend himself, Gilbert Gottfried who, and I'm not even joking here, puts on the best performance in the entire series. Any second he's on screen, any time he opens his mouth to speak, I'm hooked. I'm locked in. It is such a great comedic performance. His timing and his delivery is impeccable. And it's not just some cameo. He's in the episode for the majority. Once Chris goes in the purgatory waiting room, we got Godfrey. It turns a pretty great episode into an amazing episode. This episode really is a fine balance of existential dread and comedy. The Tale of the Night Shift. For some reason, I thought this was the final episode when I watched it. Maybe because I watched this one last on accident, but it's not. Badges. But I felt like it would have been a much better send off of the series. Because not only is it a good story, but Gary and Sam finally start a relationship together, which has been building throughout the back half of the series. Not that I care much personally, I mean, they're kids. Getting invested in a kid's relationship is weird, but it was cool to finally see things get wrapped up. Also, at the end of the episode, a hospital door closes and it has the number 65 on it. And I thought that was a super cool Easter egg because at the time, I thought this was the last episode, thus making it the 65 fifth episode uh, but no it's the 64th episode and this 65 on the door means absolutely nothing anyways it's a basic vampire story but with a hospital setting and it just executes on all fronts the characters are fleshed out they have their own arcs and share good chemistry with one another the pacing is fantastic it doesn't take too long for the vampire plot to really kick in and the hospital itself is bathed in dark lighting and shadows there's even an argument here that this episode is a bit of a zombie episode because once they're bit they kind of act like mindless zombies Either way, it's one hell of a good episode. The Tale of the Water Demons In this episode, we got an old retired captain whose house is littered with treasures from his old adventures. Our two main protagonists think it's cool, but the captain assures him that it was not cool in the slightest. He talks about aborting shipwrecks and taking rings off rotting corpses, really painting the true horrific picture of it all. He admits he can't sleep anymore because of it. You could read that as a metaphor, but what he really means by that, in a literal way, is that if he goes to sleep, those from who he stole from, the ghosts will come and get him. Which, these ghost designs are great. They're not pirates this time around. Once again, he stole from shipwrecks, so it's fun trying to figure out what decades certain ones died in given their outfit. Plus, I just think the idea of not being able to sleep or ghosts will come and drag you away is scary. It's a terrifying episode, even though the ending is much to be desired. The kids just just throwing the valuables back in the ocean and that does the trick, which I'm fine with that being the logical solution. It's just that the captain acts like it's such a good idea and he's never thought of it before. He's been haunted by these things for years and he's never thought about returning the shit he stole? But that's a minor problem and I'm willing to overlook it, especially when everything else is just so fantastic. The Tale of the dark music. Okay, let's get something straight. This episode is lame. This episode is cheesy, but the ending, the last six minutes of the episode, truly phenomenal. I think this is one of two episodes on this entire ranking where if I was to watch it as a kid, I would be scared. And let's just skip right to the ending. The basement is creepy, there's a bully character, and his sister's character is kind of a brat, okay? So that ending. Basically, there's some unexplained deity in the basement. It's got a great bone-chilling voice and red eyes 
size. However, it can take on many different forms, like this life-size doll or this skeleton carnival barker. The deities only summon when music is played, and Andy uses this knowledge to get back and scare his bully. He locks him in the basement and blasts the music. After a while, he stops the music and goes to check on the bully and see if he learned his lesson, but the bully is not there. He's gone. Just then, a brand new bicycle comes from the door. The deity then tells Andy it'll give him anything he desires most, as long as he feeds him. And then we hear Andy's sister, and a smirk spreads across Andy's face. Wow. It's so good. It's so fucking good. The rest of the episode isn't bad by any means. It's just the standard Are You For The Dark character and world setup. But the final act more than makes up for it. The Tale of the Curious Camera this is just Say Cheese and Die. This is just Goosebumps Say Cheese and Die. I really don't like comparing the show to the episodes of Goosebumps, and I've been avoiding it thus far, but I can't deny it for this episode. And if you want to know who did the idea first, the Goosebumps book came out two years before this episode, but the Goosebumps episode came out two years after this episode. All this is irrelevant, however, I will say that the tale of the Curious Camera does a much better job with the premise than Goosebumps did. At least the Goosebumps show, it's been a long time since I read the book. So yeah, it's a camera that whatever it takes a picture of, something bad will happen to it. And I do mean it. Cause in this story, humans aren't the only one affected by this. Frame photos, glass windows, hell even the goldfish are zap fried. But what I like most about this episode is that the main character puts all this together really fast. And instead of doing the typical main character thing and being scared of the camera or trying to get rid of it, he fucking uses it to get back at the kids who picked on him. Like full on hit list circling dudes photos in the yearbook. Now, I'm in no way condoning his actions, but it's nice to see a protagonist go off the beaten path and use something of this caliber for malicious revenge. Usually, the main characters are pure of heart, and Matt definitely is. He just gets overwhelmed with the amount of power at his fingertips all of a sudden. The other thing I really like about this episode is that they don't immediately show the photo Matt takes, and sometimes they don't even show you at all. All you get is Matt's reaction. It makes the scenes way more suspenseful when you don't know what's going to happen. But of course, in the end, Matt accidentally takes a photo of his parents, showing them getting in a huge car wreck, so Matt and his sister have to kill a gremlin in the camera. Because oh yeah, they give an explanation for why the camera is the way it is. It's a gremlin in the camera, and I think that's a cool and fun way of explaining what's going on. So. So they take a photo of the camera by itself in a mirror, but that just makes the gremlin hop into the camcorder, which they get it to film itself again and it blows up the camcorder and their TV. The day is saved, but the gremlin lives on in the family computer. The Tale of Dead Man's Float. I could see this being number one for a lot of people's lists. I really could. I went back and forth on this and number one a lot. Anyways, our story's protagonist is a nerdy kid named Zeke. But here's the thing, Zeke's smart and loves science, but he's also really confident and playful. He's not afraid of putting himself out there. And he's no smooth talker, but shit, he was talking to girls more confidently than I was at his age. It's just a really good character, really good characterization. His whole story is that he wants to learn how to swim because he's been putting it off ever since he almost drowned when he was little. Meanwhile, Clarice is on the swim team and offers to help him if he helps her with her chemistry. And these two characters are great together. Of course, they butt heads at the start, but they have such natural sounding dialogue and they slowly grow to understand and respect one another. Part of that growth is just being able to be vulnerable and opening up to one another. But let's get to the showstopper. The pool's got an invisible ghost that drags people to the bottom of the pool. So they dump methanol orange into the pool to make it visible and... Mwah. It's so good. It's hands down the best costume in the entire show. So may ask, how do they get away with showing this much blood on a monster? Well, that's the thing. It's not actually blood. In the show, it stated that methanol orange will stain anything red. So even though it's not blood, it's still scary and gives off the impression of blood. And it's a great way to get past the sensors, but it's legitimately scary. Anyways, they eventually do beat the monster with some chemical bullshit. It's set up in act one, so it pays off. And then the two just go on about their lives. Also, I think that idea of having a pool ghost is really scary for kids. Not just because it looks like this, but because I think kids are naturally scared of swimming growing up. So making a horror story based around that ends up working out pretty well. The Tale of the Shiny Red Bicycle. So yeah. 
believe it or not, an emotional ghost story came in first. Now, that's completely oversimplifying this episode, because the truth is, this is the most mature and real episode in the show's run. In its simplest form, it's a ghost story, but that's only if you choose to read it that way. Because the way I interpret the story, it's not about ghosts. It's about loss, grief, and trauma. Mikey watches his friend Ricky fall to his death. That's how this episode starts, and now it's been five years since the incident and Mike is still haunted by it. He's having reoccurring nightmares. His family treats it like it's nothing. They say it happened five years ago and that he should move on by now. But Mike can't move on. Part of him feels responsible for his death. Then the ghost of Ricky starts showing up, but only Mike can see him. So is this an actual ghost or just a manifestation of Mike's guilt? You can read it as either. But the point is, those are both two equally valid interpretations. Mike's younger brother is playing around the area where Ricky died, and it looks like he's heading for a similar fate. Mike finally decides to face the spirit of Ricky, expecting the ghost to kill him for letting him die, but that's not the case. Ricky does not give forgiveness because there's nothing to forgive. Ricky doesn't blame Mike for his death. He never did. He's only come back to warn Mike of the fate of his younger brother. A huge weight is lifted off Mike's chest, but he's still in a rush to save his brother. Before he departs though, he makes sure to tell Ricky that he misses him, and Ricky proclaims that he misses Mike too. And it's a little moment. It's a short moment, but it was a big moment in its own right. Mike is able to save his brother, and this time around, Mike is finally able to move on. This truly is an incredible episode, and watching this one near the end of season 2, I knew I just spoiled myself. I knew watching the remaining 3 seasons that nothing would ever come close emotionally. It's weirdly prolific for a children's show. It's not scary, I don't believe it ever tried to be scary, it's just one phenomenal episode. Hey, thank you so much for watching. I normally don't say this, but I'd really appreciate it if you like, comment, subscribe, or share this video with a friend you think would enjoy watching it. Now, the reason why I don't really say that is because I think it's a bit played out on YouTube. A bit overdone. Plus, if I'm being honest, your viewership is more than I could ever ask for. Now, there may or may not be a lot of new people watching this, so hey, I'll be real. I don't really do these long videos. My normal content is much shorter in comparison. I would say around the seven to nine minute mark on average. That being said, please check them out. I put a bunch of time and effort and passion into every single one. They're all on a variety of different subject matters, so watch one that really speaks to you. Anyways, thank you for watching. Thank you for an amazing first year on this platform, but until next time, I'll see you then.